question for today is how to identify domain and range. We've actually already defined these terms at the very beginning of the chapter. Remember in 2.1 at the very beginning, uh, it was the night of your chapter one test. You had to go home and fill in that entire first page of notes. It was a bunch of vocabulary. Domain and range were vocabulary terms listed at the very beginning of the chapter. I'd like to start off today by just going over what you remember about domain and range. So let's review. What's domain? Geo. Very good. It's possible values of x or possible values of our control variable. Very good. So if you needed to jot these down on the notes, you definitely could. You'll see I'm not writing them down. I'm just trying to verbally review. So everybody remembers domain, possible values of x, right? So what's range? Good, Alec. Yes, possible values of y or whatever else. What's y? What else could y be, Megan? The dependent variable, very good. Questions about what range is? You're okay there? Okay, ultimately, you're gonna be able to determine today uh, two ways to identify domain and range. The first way is by looking at a t-chart or ordered pairs, and then the second way is by looking at a graph. Uh, after we do these seven problems, uh, I'll let you go ahead and get started a little bit on maybe your homework tonight. We'll take a look at it together. Uh, but domain is possible values of x and range is possible values of y. It's actually pretty simple to identify domain and range when you're looking at a t-chart. If we go strictly by the definition, domain is possible values of x. So as I take a look at this particular example, my possible values of x, we always write it from smallest to largest, go negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, and negative 1. Those are my possible values of x. Range, I'm sorry, these are brackets. Um, I call them my Jay Leno brackets. Yes, here's why. There's his eye, there's his nose, and then he's got this big chin here. Yeah, once you see it, it can't be unseen. Yeah, that's all I think of when I see those now. See? Uh, but yeah, yeah, we use the brackets. The tricky part about domain and range wasn't the problem, was it? It's how to write it. That's usually going to be the case. You're going to be able to see the answer, but how to write it or how to communicate that effectively is usually the challenging part. What's up, Alec? Uh-huh. <laughs> Any other questions? <laughs> like I said, seeing the answer isn't the hard part. Writing the answer is the hard part. Effectively communicating it. What this means in, in, in language, because our symbols in math class have words that go with them, Alec, this means that x is the set of negative 4, negative 3, negative 2, and negative 1. Okay. To not include those with some sort of brackets isn't acknowledging them as a set. Thanks. I'm glad you're buying what I'm selling. All right, so range. Possible values of y, right? We go from smallest to largest, always. We have negative 14, negative 11, negative 8, and negative 5. Questions about how I identified the range in this case? Okay, function. Is it a function? Why yes or why no? What do you think? Is it a function or is it not? Let's take a vote. Who says, yes, Mrs. Lucas, that's a function? Who said, no, Mrs. Lucas, that's not a function? Oh, very good. The answer is yes. Let's dwell on this for a moment. Why is it a function? Kristen. Oh, look at that. Girl knows her definition. Um, yeah. So for each input, there is exactly one output. Very well stated. Okay. Um, yeah, I don't have any X's repeating themselves. So this would not fail the vertical line test if you think about it. We'll talk more about the vertical line test when I talk about pictures in just a second. What type of function is it?
Good, Kristen? It is linear. Very good. How could you tell? You had to do this on your homework a little bit too. You had to like look and kind of make a conjecture about if the data was linear. How did you look at this and establish, oh yeah, that's linear. Yes, but you can have that like one-to-one -one relationship and have it not make a line. Fun fact. Um, for instance, I could have a graph that kind of goes, you know, like this. You get that one-to-one -one sort of relationship, but that's actually not a linear function. That's actually exponential. What do you think, Gio? Um, no, that's not quite it. It's not positive, is it? Is this an increasing function? No. As x increases, y decreases. So slope of positive 3 isn't quite right. Slope would be negative 3, right? To see how it's decreasing by 3 each time. Yeah. It's kind of written weird. It's only like the bottom part of our t chart that we typically see. Uh, yeah. So as x increases, y decreases. So you have to have that, that negative slope. You see it, Geo? Okay. So... Yes, this is a linear function because there's a pretty consistent rate of change between our points. Remember, if you're doubting if something's linear, what's the best test? If you graph it, it would make a line. If we plotted out these points, we would get this continuous rate of decay, this rate of change of negative 3 from point to point to point. You see that? So your slope is negative 3. So not only is it a function, it was a linear function. Okay, eyes on the prize. What I'm trying to do with you today is domain and range. So now you get to try, and I'm going to walk around and start checking off some two sixes. Okay, that should be your answers to number two. Did you get them right? Put that back. That could be part of the problem. We got to clear your RAM. Second plus seven, one, two. Clear your RAM. Okay. All right, so. Any questions about number two? Everybody get that one right? It looked pretty good as I was walking around, but I only saw that first row. All right, good. Um, notice that my data always go from smallest to largest uh, when I write my domain and my range. Uh, next up, my blank slideshow here. All right. Now we have to be able to do it. The rest of the entire note sheet for today has us looking at a Cartesian plane to determine domain and range. The long way to do that is to turn it back into either a t-chart or a set of ordered pairs and then just do what you did before pick out all the x's and pick out all the y's so that's going to be the way i do it first as you look at this particular problem in number three i see that there's a bunch of dots if i want to identify the domain and range for that problem i need to list out the ordered pairs associated with those dots uh, i always go from smallest to largest so for instance my first x value that i see is at one and i go up two and then at 2, I go down 1, but at 2, I also go up 5. And then at 3, we go down 4. And then at 3, we also go up to 8. So my domain values can be identified as my possible values of x. If anything repeats, you just still write it out one time. So for instance, I see domain values at 1. 2 and 3. Oops. 1, 2, and 3. Bracket. My range values are just my possible values of y. And again, I want to go smallest to largest. My smallest y value here is at negative 4. Uh, so it goes from negative 4 to negative 1 to 2 to 5. And then at 8. My question to you is, is this a function? Let's say, let's take a vote. Who says yes? Who says no? Oh, good job. Jared, what do you think? Yeah, it's not a function. Um, why is it not a function?
vertical line. That was what I was looking for there, yeah. Um, so this thing essentially fails the vertical line test. In other words, the input of 2 is mapped onto more than one output, and so is 3. 3 is mapped onto more than one output. That means it's not going to fit our definition for a function. So this does fail the vertical line test. It's a no. Now, like I said before, I feel like that's the long way to do these problems, and in the end it's not very practical. Because what if you get tons and tons of points? So you don't want to write out all those ordered pairs and then go back and pick out all the x's and all the y's. So let me just give you a kind of a different way of looking at these problems. And you see my little intro up there? I'm like, oh, it's like a walk in the park. So that's you, right? You've lost weight. You're now a stick person. I'll make you smaller. Really small. Eh, maybe not that small. But now I'm going to make you dizzy. Whoa. Don't puke. Okay. So now what we're going to do is we always start from smallest to largest, right? So that's you. And you, imagine yourself standing on the negative x-axis, right, Luke? That's not on task, right? <laughs> so you're standing on the negative x-axis. And what you're going to do is you're going to walk along on that x-axis. And right now I'm standing at like, I don't know, negative 4, right? If I'm standing at an x value of negative 4, imagine you look up and you look down. You don't see any points there, do you? No, you don't. Okay, now we're going to go ahead and make you walk a little bit further, maybe to negative 2. Right now you're at x equals negative 2. And you look up and you look down. And you don't see any points. I could make you walk over. This is you. Oh, yeah. Imagine now you're standing right on the y-axis. That's the line x equals 0. If you look up and you look down, you see nothing but axis. No points. None. Uh, even at like 0.5, right there, right at 0.5, you don't see any points if you look up or you look down. You actually don't see a point until oh, it's like right on your chest. It's like right at x equals 1. That's the very first spot that our graph has an x value at x equals 1. And then you really don't see another one if you're walking along until 2. And then you don't see another one until 3. Where you see those x values are your possible values of x, a.k.a. your domain. So what I'd like you to do is just in your head kind of shift from an understanding of domain being x's in ordered pairs to space that um, our graph takes up on the x-axis. So domain is possible values of x, but you could also think of it as the space that our graph takes up on the x-axis. So this graph takes up a space of 1, 2, and 3 on the x-axis. Range, um, sort of conversely, is possible values of y. So I'm going to flip you on your side here. <gasps> ah, that's not what I wanted it to do. Okay. Here's you. Turn you on your side. And we always start from smallest to largest. So here's you walking along, you know, like negative 6, you don't see anything. Negative 5, oh, there's one. Negative 4, if you look up or down from where you're standing right there, do you see how there's that very first bottom y value right at negative 4? So that's our first range. And then as you walk along the y-axis, you finally see another one. Oh my gosh, that one's like right on your face. Um, that one's like at negative 1 right there. So that's your next range value. Uh, and you could kind of carry on to see that, oh yeah, there's one at 2 then one up a little higher at 5, and then another one up at 8. So that's like kind of just another way of looking at it. Now you try. You could write out all the ordered pairs if you wanted to, and then pull out the x's and pull out the y's. Or you could just try to read the graph from left to right. You're picking out spaces that are taken up by the graph on the x-axis and spaces that are taken up by the graph on the y-axis. Okay, so if you got this one right, that's kind of what it's looking like. You see that I skipped the step for ordered pairs altogether because ultimately I don't find that to be super efficient. I look for spaces that the graph takes up on the x-axis in order to identify domain. And then to identify range, I look for the spaces that the graph takes up on the y-axis. What's up, Alec? Can we do it either way? Yeah, but sometimes the ordered pairs just aren't practical. Ready? Awesome segue into the next example. Yeah, like look at this guy. So take a look for a second. So my graph starts here and stops there. Do you see those two smiley faces? All right, you ready? I have a question for you. Exactly. No rounding. None. No rounding. 
exactly how many points exist on this graph in between my two smileys. Do you know Geo? Infinitely many, yes. So how are you going to list out all of those ordered pairs to identify domain and range? Why is there infinitely many points between the two smileys? Because according to the rules of the real number system, between any two numbers, there are infinitely many numbers. Between one and two, infinitely number, many numbers in, exist in between those two numbers. Can't you just tell me what the points are? Right, but we're talking about the points in between, right? You can't list out individual ordered pairs for this function because it's called continuous. We didn't pick up our pencil to draw it in. These were discrete graphs. You remember we reviewed, oh, I don't know that I got to review it because it was on the shoe forearm activity, discrete versus continuous, and you guys had a fire drill, or like two of them. But discrete means dots. Continuous means this, like we never pick up our pencil to draw it. So there's infinitely many points between those two smileys. We can't possibly list out all of the ordered pairs. Or what are you going to do? Like list out like, oh look, there's a point at like 1.75 comma 1.75. Like you can't do that, right? Or 2 comma 1.75. There's just too many points to list. Do you see that? Does everybody see infinitely many points up there? Danielle. <clears throat> Our eyes should go to the dots. I'm not going to argue that. Your eyes should go to the dots. Here's how you're going to write domain and range when your graph is continuous. Are you ready? You are going to pretend like you're walking along the x-axis, right? So here's you once again. I'm going to shrink you down a little bit. And I'm going to make you hop up on the negative x-axis. Okay, domain are possible values of x. So over here at x equals negative 8, I don't see any dots. I don't see any dots until I get to that first smiley, which is at x equals negative 2. It's a closed circle. Watch out, because on your homework, it's not always that way. This is a closed circle at x equals negative 2. And then I notice I can take this little dude for a walk for a couple of steps, right? We can do negative two. I can do negative one and a half and I see a dot. I see a dot at one. I see a dot at po negative point three. I see a dot at zero, at point five, at one. I see dots all the way until I get to right there if I'm walking along. That's where my graph stops. That's the last possible x value that this graph takes up. What's up, Daniel? So it stops at 4. Does everybody see how that starts and stops at 4? Now, what I'm defining right now is a domain. So these are possible values of x. What I'm trying to tell you right now is that x is between negative 2 and 4, including negative 2 and 4. So that's how you could write that. It's an inequality. That just literally says in words, x is between negative 2 and 4 inclusive. If there were open circles there, what symbols would you use, Danielle? Yeah, so you drop the equal to symbols. Do you see that? Yeah. You, in order to draw this, I would never pick up my pencil. It's called continuous when I can do that. It's different than the one before it. It was discrete because I picked up my pencil to draw those dots. Okay. Range. Flip them over. I'm going to move them down on the negative y axis, right? And I got to find, I'm going for a walk. Right now, I don't see anything down on the negative y axis. I don't even see anything at zero. I don't see my first range value until I get to a y value of one. That's the minimum value of this curve. So the first y value that I see is at one. And then I keep walking until I don't see any more y values. So I think I see them at 3. And even beyond that, I see some y values at 4. So these y values go between 1 and 4. <clears throat> Those are my range values. To be honest with you, there's one more way you could write these. Since I have closed circles, defined endpoints for this function, you're actually what, allowed to use what's called interval notation as well. The domain of this function, sorry, I'm going to color code this a little bit. The domain of this function goes from negative 2 to 4. The range of this function goes from 1 to 4. Notice I use brackets. When I have a less than or greater than symbol, 
In other words, an open circle appeared on my graph. I use parentheses. Firm brackets are used when your points exist, when those are actual solutions to the curve. This is a function because it passes the vertical line test. Okay. Now you try. Domain and range. You could use interval notation or you could use inequalities. Alrighty there, folks. So again, just to review, there's two ways you could write your answer, right? The x values go from negative 4 to 2. Just sit it there. Thank you, Jenna. And then your y values go from negative 5 to 4. Notice I use brackets. Why did I use brackets instead of parentheses on this problem? Let's see if you guys caught that from the last explanation. Go ahead, Megan. Yeah, we have dots that are closed. Yeah, because it's not a set. Like, I don't know if I know clearly what you're saying, Alec. Like, like this? This is fine. Yeah, yeah, because that's a little bit different. Do you see how the types of problems are different? One's dots. Not okay, it's yes or no. Do you see how they're different? Yeah, okay. No, you can't. There's about a thousand things that just rushed into my head that I should not say right now. And I won't. Okay, so we have one through eight um, for your homework assignment for tonight. Uh, you are cutting out the little uh, 16 strips and pasting them into their appropriate spot. Um, you did have one last conclusion question there. Keep in mind, number seven was not a function because it failed the vertical line test. Everybody understand what your assignment is for tonight? Cut and paste. Yeah, you're doing this cut and paste. So you're cutting these 16 out and then you're arranging them on the other you got. So there's eight problems. Two piece, yeah. Each one gets a domain and each one gets a range. Choose carefully. 